Some of the audience might not understand the nature of of, um, of the proper now group, which I think is a, a fantastic and innovative um, phenomenon in Australian art. The proper now group is a group of urban indigenous artists who um, operate almost like a family, and they all have a, a, a different role in the group, as I've noticed. Jennifer's kind of like mum, mother superior, <laughs> treasure, <laughs> treasure. <laughs> and, and keep and the glue that holds it all together. And it has you know, the most fantastic um, <laughs> membership. Uh, you know, people of the stature of uh, Vernon and, and Richard and Gordon, and, and, um, and, and she manages to keep these personalities together. Like, you're going to. If any of you have been you know, he's a volatile cracker and he's own right. And, um, and, and, um, and the whole thing works as a community and it seems to be based on um, indigenous traditions of community interaction, totally different to those that uh, pertain in, in our Western world. In the European society, people live in their own individual little boxes in a way. Whereas here, there's this constant interaction, and there's also determination to critically examine what they do. Uh, the whole name of the group, Proper Now, is a colloquialism in urban Aboriginal parlance, which means that you've got to keep to correctness of action in relation to your own community and that you evaluate what you do and what I've noticed with the group is they critique each other constantly they debate about issues and they refine their own work by their interaction with each other so their achievement is a group achievement in the long run the western world recognises the stars that they've happened to have picked out but to my mind the stars are the whole lot of them and I'd like to congratulate them all. Thank you. And just on that note, I have to say that it is really good to be a part of a group of artists. Um, I don't know whether I would have been able to keep going as an artist if it wasn't for the interaction that I had with, you know, Andrea and Tony and Vernon and Gordon and Richard, you know. They actually, you know, they keep keep your spirit going, you know. And um, certainly, you know, Gordon would come in every couple of days to see how I was going and how I wasn't going, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's good to know that there's other people interested in what you're doing um, um, besides yourself because if I get left on my own devices, so I think I would have just packed up shop and decided it was Hard. But um, um, I, I'm certainly interested in doing a lot more and I, I um, hopefully can uh, keep going even in spite of these um, economic um, times. It's not going to be um, great for the artist I'm sure but um, um, you know I don't think sometimes you can help what you choose to do in life and um, I've certainly chosen the creative um, sphere so I, I hope very much to keep working in that area. But thank you. Thank Jim, you all. Can I ask you about the warrior woman and that whole the the clothing and the staff. Can you talk about those things and that? Well the warrior woman Really, it was, it was it was talking about um, the idea of how, how does one protect themselves in in conflict in battle, 
And since most of my work is about conflict and battles that are taking place, it's proposing ideas of how we could best protect ourselves as people, as women, you know? How do, how do we protect ourselves against the onslaught of society? Um, how do you guard against that? Um, what armour could you put on that would protect you when someone wants to wants to wipe you out, finish you off? Um, it seemed, you know, certainly when I was researching conflict between black and white Australia, it, there was um, this idea, and there was one one uh, thing that Christy Palmson wrote. I'm trying to read as I'm shutting my eyes to remember. Um, and and he wrote, um, our guns. Um, went through their shields as if they were sheets of paper. Um, and, and they were saying that, you know, like their um, um, guns and um, guns and uh, what else were they using uh, were no match for um, spears and shields. So the was that uh, Indigenous peoples had it that those time, in those times, but um, I'd started thinking about, you know, how how warriors face battle, how they stand up um, to an onslaught um, when they don't have much protecting them, and I think um, you know even the so so people's psychology of, of, of doing battle comes into it. And I was thinking about, you know, the way the Maoris do the haka to prepare themselves for warfare. And they do it, you know, in football for the man, but, you know, um, <laughs> go war on football grounds. So it was from those, those kinds of um, um, ideas that I was, I was I was looking at, um, you know, how we might best protect ourselves, and in the end, can we protect ourselves? Um, is there any, is there any protection at all? You might as well be just wearing a cloak or whatever. Even if you had steel armour, um, there's still ways that you can you can kill the government. They used to aim aim their the, the guns and weapons at, at the slits in the armour, you know, um, to kill people, even though they were, like, you would think they were impenetrable. If, if people um, have a will to kill you, they will. So, yeah, that answers your question. Well, the only uh, armour that seems to remain is in culture. Mm -hmm. That's what that seems to be saying to me. Mm -hmm. 